welcome back to Literally Literary. My name is Vanessa Zuniga. Literally Literary is brought to you by the Mellon Foundation through the Humanities Collaborative at EPCC and UTEP. This is part three of Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo, where we will discuss part three and the audiobook. Today we have our very first guest, Reina Munoz. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Bienvenida. <laughs> Reina, did you want to tell us, uh, the, the listeners, who you are and why you're here? Yeah, so my name is Reina Munoz, and I teach at Rio Grande. I teach English. And I'm here because Vanessa and Jorge Gomez both invited me to, and because Richie is very generous and nice to have me here as well. Um, I read this book a couple of weeks ago, barely, so I'm... I've been reading or listening to the podcast and um, happy to contribute, but it was kind of nice that it all fit in that I got invited because um, I've just been so immersed in this book and I haven't been able to stop talking about it for the past few weeks. So I'm glad that I get to <laughs> to add my little, like my two cents to this. Oh, yeah. So thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Um, well, thank you for coming and uh, taking the time on a Saturday to be here. Um, we really want to get your perspective also on the on the audiobook since you know you were that's one of the first things that we first started talking about when it came to mm -hmm. this book and the differences between that and the print version. Mm -hmm. um, but um, Vanessa, did you want to start us off with um, your first poem from part three? Sure. So I actually wanted to talk about. The Ugly, which uh, happens right after... <laughs> jumping right into it. Wow. <laughs> Man, I lost my flow. Okay, so... <laughs> Siomara comes rushing home right after she realizes that she left her journal um, on her kitchen table where her mom can find it. Um, and so it's like... Really, it's very descriptive of how she's feeling and she's kind of afraid of what her mom's going to say because obviously her mom's going to see it on the table and read it. Um, Did you have a strong line from it? Hmm. I think all of the quotes that she uses of her mom are pretty strong. Um, like one of the first ones is, you think I don't know enough English to figure out you talk about boys mm. and church and me to know all these terrible things you think. So like her mom's kind of explaining to her that she understands what Siomara is talking about. I mean, this this is such a, a pivotal moment in the book. Like I, it really affected me viscerally when it, when it came to that point, you know, um, which is quite incendiary, right? Literally. Yeah. in that sense and uh, it's just kind of this clash that's been built up throughout the entire book so far you know and, and then even i think you wanted to talk about verses right yes that's okay. that comes right after because that, that's kind of um, like the the world the whirlwind comes out out of that mm -hmm. and the the ugly though um we should point out that the two previous poems are the good and the bad yeah that's right and so this is the ugly and so it's like the um the climax of this moment where that she's been dreading that, you know, we have experienced a mother for most of the novel as the antagonist, I think, in most of these poems. And so this just kind of reiterates that um, to where we're, we're scared for Siomara. At least I felt that way. Mm -hmm. And um, I put an asterisk next to, the lines, my mother has always seemed like a big woman, even though she's so much smaller than I am, because I could relate so, so much. My mom is 4'11", and she's this big force um, who I've always been afraid of, so I could totally <laughs> relate to that. Um, but yeah, it, it just it, it spoke to me on, on so many levels, but we could totally just feel that tension, that fear that Siomara was feeling in that moment of what is she going to do, um, which we get. You know, when, when you talk about your own your own mother and how you connect it to the text, it, you know, kind of speaks to uh, how we as, as teachers want our students to connect to the text, right? And so there's mm -hmm. um, what we call wall, um, windows, which is when um, 
students get uh, a perspective of a story that they don't relate to, and so like Shakespeare or Milton or whatever. Um, but then you have uh, mirrors, and I like the idea of mirrors because um, from what I've read from the scholarship is that it engages students more to see themselves in a story. And mm-hmm. I don't know for when it was for y'all when you first um, you first saw yourself in a story. I think it was for me like maybe senior year of, of university. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, again, um, we had talked about this in the first episode about the lack of diversity in literature and mm-hmm. not just in the publication, but in the, in the publications themselves, but in the classroom. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing about your experience that you related is the, the matriarchal culture that we get in Latinx communities. And I, I have that too with my grandmother. She's the matriarch. And um, not a, a, as imposing, you know, as what you say about your mom, but um, <laughs> but it, 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but that same idea, you know, that um, um, it I I I do think that's a good thing. You know, it goes against like um, these patriarchal systems that we have everywhere else, mm-hmm. and that machista culture that is also very um, toxic. And, you know, it, it's kind of the same thing as the toxic masculinity of American culture. Oh. And she says a lot about that in the in these poems as well, um, when she's sitting on the stoop, when she's encountering that, right? So mm-hmm. there there is a lot of commentary um, on Xiomara's part uh, and just how the, how she's trying to negotiate that and then what she's experiencing at home because her father is like not that right Mm -hmm. he's like now this silenced figure who's there but not there and her mom is this force this presence Mm -hmm. this um strict christ uh christian or catholic right um so yeah i think it it, she's definitely doing that on purpose Right. I'm mm-hmm. um, trying to say something about that patriarchal system and the matriarchal system that Tiomara is um, dealing with daily. And, and, and she embodies a kind of duality, too. I don't know how you all mm-hmm. feel about that, mm-hmm. you know, because she kind of takes on her mom's quality and how, you know, she defends twin and um, she mm-hmm. stands up for herself. You know, um, she's assertive. Right. Um so there's part of her mom in her that we see, mm-hmm. um, and you know that that kind of, of representation also of women, right, goes against the grain to some degree of like the, it isn't, of course, like the old school, you know, fairy tale damsel in distress. Uh, and I think all you know from a from a representation perspective, it's important to get these stories out of you know women who are self empowered. They don't need a man to feel like, you know, they, they belong somewhere or that they have a voice. Um, and there's always, there always seems to be like this backlash whenever there's a film or a book that features a woman as a protagonist, Mm -hmm. you know, we see it with like the, the whole Marvel comics thing and, Mm -hmm. and Captain Marvel, you know, just because she's a woman, somehow she can't be a superhero Mm -hmm. who's super powerful. Pretty toxic online culture there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Specifically. Yeah. Well, I mean, so right after that piece, um, there's the, the Let Me Explain poem. And something that that uh, <clears throat> Acevedo does so well, I think, is is in the way this is written. At the most intense moment, right, she kind of shortens the prose, these short lines of, like, mm-hmm. it's almost like your breath is shortened and mm-hmm. it, it brings you right in there, into it. Like, you know, we talk, we've been talking a lot about embodiment of poems. Here's where the the text is maybe reflecting how we're feeling as the reader. You know, let me explain. You got these short, short, short lines and exasperation, essentially. Mm -hmm. Just before, uh, it's just this very, like, matter of fact for a character. Like, she knows what she's going to do. She sees the matches, and she just kind of commands her, bring, right? Um, I don't want ashes on my floor. Yeah. Which, Which, again, like, just reinforces, or at least, you know, for the reader, I think, for most readers just that that um pressure tension fear that we're like 
you know, oh, crap, we're, we're here with Xiomara. We don't want this to happen. She's mm-hmm. not going to burn her journal. Which, you know, as because we know how important that has been for her mm-hmm. during this this period in her life to to express maybe what she can't do um, vocally, right? She, she's within. And she's figuring that out through through spoken word poetry and slam poetry, but that notebook is so much more than that, right? It's the, those beginning stages of getting her thoughts out. So to burn it is just now her mother's, you know, she's she missing something. There. There's that lack of communication there between the two. Yeah, and and speaking of notebooks, Vanessa, you have a notebook of poems of, of your own, a chapbook uh, that you read from mm-hmm. at. This past Thursday's, um, it's last Thursday's, I should say, last Thursday's is <laughs> literally what it's called. This is the event, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, um, so you read there as part of the Bart Bart Open Mic series at B17 Bombers. Um, and so do you feel like you're, you know, reading this po- reading this collection or novel? Um, and I know with Reina that there, there's something to talk about there mm-hmm. in terms of the form. Um, do you feel like now, like more confident, like now that you have a story of someone who's kind of in similar shoes as you? I mean, yeah, it's very relatable, especially to me, because I'm trying to do these same things that she's kind of doing with her writings. Um, I don't know, just have somewhere to write my thoughts down and then eventually maybe be able to share them with others. Yeah. Well, just make sure you're, you know... You keep keep it away from fire, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, the only fire is on the stage, you know. Yeah. Mm, yes. Lit. Yeah. You put the lit in literary. Yes. <laughs> um, the fire on the stage. Yes. Mm-hmm. But I know. Um, I, I like that, and maybe we can touch on that earlier. I mean, sorry, a little later, because I know, um, the ne- like chronologically, the the poem verses is right after these moments we've been talking about, and I know you had mm-hmm. some things you wanted to say about about that or share about that poem yeah um so verses is a couple of um or it's the next no yeah a couple poems after that um and jorge and vanessa you you both talked about this in the last episode um about that poem where um it wasn't clear what scriptures or verses Xiomara was talking about that she wasn't technically lying to her mom when she said she was practicing or memorizing verses um and so I really like this one because it's the back and forth it's that conversation slash non-conversation that she's having with her mom where they're both both just kind of talking at each other in the heat of the moment and she's spewing out her uh her verses that she has inside of her that we've seen for the whole novel up until now. And her mother is retorting with scripture, right? Because it's what she knows, um, what's inside of her. And so it it was, it's a really powerful, um, you know, powerful poem for me, just to see that juxtaposition of just how different they are, but how similar they are too, right? Because they both are, you know um coming back to what they know what is true to them what is inside of them what they want to share um but they're not finding common ground at this mm-hmm. moment and we see that visually too in on the page right mm-hmm. and um <clears throat> you know spanish and english and which is also like the wordplay on verses right mm-hmm. oh yeah against yeah. each other verses mm-hmm. you know competing. right yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's like so obvious. Mind blown. <laughs> wow. Yes. Um, All right. Vanessa, head out. <laughs> <laughs> and Vanessa, was this also a poem that you had chosen to talk about? Or? It wasn't, but I looking at it, looking at it again, um, I feel like it is really strong, and like you get to do, you really do see that comparison of like who they are as people, and like Rena said, what they have inside of them. Mm-hmm. So we're going back a little bit to um, Wednesday, November 14th, a poem Mommy Will Never Read. And so this one stands out to me because it's, I think it's the only poem that's in Spanish and then it's followed by the translation of the poem. We don't see that 
before this, right? No, no. Okay. Um, so it's in Spanish, and if it's okay, I, I would like to read it. Please. Mi boca no puede escribir una bandera blanca. Nunca será un verso de la Biblia. Mi boca no puede formarse el lamento que tú dices tú y Dios merecen. Tú dices que todo esto es culpa de mi boca, porque tenía hambre, porque era callada. Pero, ¿y la boca tuya? ¿Cómo tus labios son grapas que me perforan rápido y fuerte? Y las palabras que nunca dije quedan mejor muertas en mi lengua, porque solamente hubieran chocado contra la puerta cerrada de tu espalda. Tu silencio amuebla una casa oscura, pero aún a riesgo de quemarse, la mariposa nocturna siempre busca la luz. And then it's translated on the next page, but um, it moved me for several reasons. Um, I wrote the most on this page <laughs> than any other page. Um, not just because it's the only poem that's in Spanish, but because I feel that here, I mean, just the title, Poem Mommy Will Never Read, you know, it kind of just goes back to this whole, she can't, she doesn't feel comfortable enough sharing with her mother. Um, but also she doesn't want to share with her mother. She doesn't, you know, um, this is her poem for herself. Um, Mi boca no puede escribir una bandera blanca, nunca será un verso de la Biblia. It's, it's this not giving up. My voice is here to stay, but it's also not holy, and which is what she, her mother expects of her, right? One of the things. Um, and then at the end of that second stanza, pero y la boca tuya? I love, love, love that line because it, it shows how brave she is, how far she's come. It shows this act of rebellion. And so I think this is a pivotal moment for her because we, we get throughout the entire novel just how scared she is. Like, here are all my mom's rules and here's all I can't do and what I'm expected to do. But now that she's read at the poetry slam or, um, you know, now she's, she's rebelling, but in a good way. Right. She's she's found her voice. She's comfortable now. And she's not only comfortable with herself, but enough to um, to question God. Right. Which you all talked about in, in episode two, but also to um, to question her mom. So I really like this. You know, it's it's um, her acknowledging all of these things and, and us knowing them already, which is kind of nice. But then rooting for her because yes Siomara is now you know pushing that threshold as well and that last line of the mariposa nocturna mm -hmm. um to me that's 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 my strong line from it um because it relates a lot to the risks that she's willing to take on you know by going against the the, the main authority figure here and um um the you know symbolically also the idea of um you know wings and its its association with uh, freedom and seeking the light and that light is something i'll come back to at the in the very last essay because it kind of you know it's another kind of light right it's not the light from the matches that represents destruction and uh, parochialness it's a light of, of, of a passion and inspiration and, and the voice that she's, she's found, you know, through this particular channel. Aside from that one, Reina, um, Vanessa, did you have another one from this third part that you wanted to go over? I liked Homecoming. Um, it's, very, it's very much towards the end of the book, um, but it's when Siomara, she's already talked to all of the people in her life, kind of, and they're all kind of telling her, you need to fix things with your mom. And But she feels like she can't go talk to her mom on her own because I feel she feels like it'll just turn into another fight. So what she does is she brings in a mediator, which ends up being Father Sean, and he kind of helps them keep the balance, and each 
individually share their own thoughts and why they're acting the way that they are towards one another. Yeah, it is kind of interesting how Father Sean, like I had said in, in the previous episode, I think it was where he he really runs out nicely as as a, as a and like you said, right, a mediator. And so he does break that stereotype of like, you know, the the fundamentalist priest who isn't willing to, you know, just like you had said in the previous um, the, the the previous poem that we had talked about about how. Yamada was question, you know, just throwing questions at him, and you know he was very res- uh, re- resistant to that. Um, so I really like how he kind of had this this role here, and, and I think it's it's a good it's a good turn for him. It's it's um it's um it um it, it, it's credible, right? Like you know, it, it doesn't seem forced. Mm-hmm. And I think it goes back to like what Richie had said in one of the first episodes where some of the characters kind of start off as being just very stock characters. But Mm -hmm. towards the end, you like all of them are fully fleshed, very developed characters. And so I feel like this poem especially helps kind of develop Father Sean a little bit more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and so how how did you guys feel about this climactic moment where, um, you know, we get the roundest, not just to Father Shun, but, but to um, the, her mom. How did you guys feel about that turn for her? I really liked it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I it's not very common that you have a story where you, all of the characters are fully fleshed out, I feel. So I felt like it was really good that, like, you don't get everything right away, but you kind of, by the end of it, everything is, like, you know everything. And yet, some things we don't know, right? Like, um, we we get, like, secondhand through her journal. And um, last I heard, um, Elizabeth Acevedo was going to put out a, a journal with, like, writing prompts. You mentioned this, Vanessa, in your own poetics mm-hmm. workshop last week or yeah this 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 week this past week um but we ourselves as readers are deprived of the actual spoken word poems and uh, we had all had some different thoughts on that um but maybe we could you know pass the mic here to richie and richie since you are a, a spoken word artist and an mc um you, i know you also had some poems about that and this part, right, that you wanted to um, yeah. highlight? <clears throat> yeah, actually, that's uh, pretty interesting how I uh, never really get to, even though it's uh, we're all reading her her poems mm-hmm. through the journal, right? Uh, we, don't, we never really get to experience her or actually see them or hear them. But um, something I wanted to kind of expand on is in the previous episodes, we've talked about uh, literary sponsors and, and how instrumental... Miss Galliano is to promoting her, her, supporting her, getting her to write, and and um, so there's this moment of the open mic, and they don't go to any to just any uh, venue. It's a it is a very legendary place, uh, the New Rican Poets Cafe, which um, <clears throat> if anyone is into spoken word or poetry, has some familiarity with. A lot of the the greats have read there and performed there, and as she comments on often has a line, you know, around the corner to get in and, and even to perform, like, you have to be there on a really good day early to, to get there. And the New Rican Poets Cafe is traditionally um, a, a space a, a for minorities, uh, people of color, like underrepresented, underrepresented uh, groups. And so that's kind of one of the instrumental things here. And uh, so her opportunity to read kind of, becomes this this moment where you see this build up right to first reading for Aman and then of course reading through a poetry club of this this sensation of of that really satisfies her of being hurt being hurt like that's all she wants um early you know in earlier episodes I talked about her anxieties of, of trying to like express herself and and starting with taking lyrics and how people connect to that to reading at the open mic for the first time. And, and I like the way Acevedo kind of shares these sensations of, you know, when you're nervous, you kind of block everything off, you know, you see, you see the lights and maybe you forget your line. But like once she just kind of gave herself up to the moment, 
she went and did her thing. And and the line, to me, the strong line, uh, um, my poem is uh, Invitation. What page is that? On page 281. And they're talking about, about her performance, right? And actually, oh, sorry, on 282, because this is kind of the part I wanted to talk about. You kind of see her kind of make these final connections, right? I, you know, I mentioned before, I always like to talk about these literary threads that you pull out a book. And so her expanding awareness of, of what this is for her, and not just for her, but for her forming of a community, a place where people can heal and, and express themselves, something that is really, really important for maybe Latinx people and, or people of color who might be going through some issues, like having a space where that can happen. Mm -hmm. And so we were talking about literary sponsors. Sometimes mm -hmm. that is outside of academia, outside mm -hmm. of school, mm -hmm. right? And that's why places like Poetry Slams, Open Mics, other types of clubs are really important. And so she's it, she says it here on 282, uh, because so many of the poems tonight felt a little like our own stories, like we saw and were seen. And how crazy would it be if I did that for someone else? Mm -hmm. You know, there it is, her kind of mission as a as a budding artist. Like, I want to tell my story and do so. Other people, you know, will connect that way. How she, earlier in the book, she's able to connect through song lyrics in that same way. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, I'll go ahead and leave it at that. <laughs> is that is that sometimes a misconception of spoken word or any kind of artistry? It's like, are these people just trying to put out what they think is good or are they trying mm. to get other people to connect with their art especially something like poetry because poetry can be so personal right mm -hmm. and as we see in this novel it is so personal for her she even acknowledges it and says it um how other kids in the club are talking about school or the cafeteria or whatever that's what they're writing about mm -hmm. but she's writing about a mom she's writing about her mom um mm. and so it, I don't know. I don't know if I. If well, no. In terms, of, I mean, in terms of content, and I. And by the way, I love that you mentioned the poetry club because I love the way she even kind of builds these characters up and 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 their different styles, right? Like he's studying for the SAT, right? And he, yeah, he has all, he these big all these words. words. <laughs> I remember, that, I remember that. <laughs> like, ah, so shiny, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely, she has a, a more confessional style, and you know, mm -hmm. I think that's part of the strength that I think people recognize when she goes goes to read in public that. Mm -hmm. These are stories that people can identify with. Um, <clears throat> oh, I know what that is. My iPad. Ah. <laughs> Man, I'm sorry, guys. Here's my head at. It's good filler. I'm going to edit that out. But, uh, you know, I, I think in terms of, like, the the goal, I mean, that's going to vary. I, I remember one time when I first started to do open mics, there was a, a poet there who, who said, like, I don't know, I just... I thought it was the, the most BS thing ever. He's like, he he seemed very self important, you know, on himself. He's like, I don't I don't read anyone else. I just you know I don't want it to affect my work. I'm like, how how do you get? I don't know. Like I don't know how you yeah. get to that point. Yeah. Um, but to me, the most powerful moments of the open mic have been those moments of vulnerability of people who sometimes just need to get something off of their chest to express themselves. And, you know, as someone who, you know, I'm the project director of this open mic, I've had so many people over the years confide in me how important it was for them to to kind of have a community where mm -hmm. they can share this and, and really have a support system. Because mm -hmm. I know <clears throat> kind of outside of that, people will kind of smirk at or kind of mock spoken mm -hmm. word poetry and slam, like kind of make fun of it a little bit, but... You know, it's an outlet. It's a legitimate outlet. And I mean, some people come through some of their darkest moments and then it's really helped them pull through just from my own like experience. And that's where the magic happens. And I think that's what Siomata specifically is kind of experiencing, you know, from her own personal life to the public life and sharing that. I don't know if that even answers what you asked. I, I, it does totally. And just rereading those that strong line because it was my strong line, too. How crazy would it be if I did that for someone else? It goes back, coming back to that conversation about representation, and mm -hmm. um, and she talks about this too when when she's um, she's reading that video that you showed last week, Vanessa. 
Um, she talked a little bit about that, about how she just wanted to see herself on the page. How many times have we yeah. heard that over the years? Have we experienced mm -hmm. that? We just want to see ourselves um, in these works and at these poetry slams and in these spaces. And not as, as a tokenism as well. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so many times right. you, you have these um, stereotype characters, you know, like anytime there's a Latinx or a specifically like a Mexican character, you know, they're like a drug dealer or something. And um, so I think it is very important for students to see the positive role models mm. as much as it is for them to see like some of the, you know, the, the humanizing of like, you know, people who fall into those traps of like addiction and drug dealing without going into the demonization and um, of those communities themselves. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when we did our... our Literary reading for Latinx history, uh, heritage. <laughs> Man, I'm a mess. <laughs> We're going to have a bloopers reel for this. I one. totally thought I was going to be the mess today. Oh, <laughs> man. I think you brought it out of me somehow. Like, contagious. No, I'm just kidding. No. That's it's a dynamic. I know. No, no. I, it's, I'm the only new thing here. So <laughs> no, I, I'll I'm, take I'm normally mind. so smooth. No, I'm just <laughs> no uh, when we did that, I, uh, the read in, I, I shared some work and mentioned a uh, pretty prominent spoken word poet in the Southwest by the name of Jose Guerrero. And he brings that issue up a lot in his work about identity. Um, you know, he has a couple of different pieces. Um, he's, he's also an actor. And so, you know, one of his pieces is about like, the limited roles, you know, in terms of represent representation, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I just, I, I bring him up because he's from El Paso, he, El Paso Juarez, and he's been living in Colorado, but, you know, if you guys want to check out more work, definitely recommend him. You know, he has that, the frat party one where he calls people out on cultural appropriation. Um, pretty touching stuff. Anyway, yeah. yeah, I was just thinking of that thread when we had the reading, the read in and mm -hmm. representation. Yeah. And speaking of, of performing poetry, um, Raina, we also brought you here um, to share your, your thoughts on, on the audio book. And I don't know what you read, what you read first, quote unquote, um, mm -hmm. but what did you feel were like the distinct differences between the two art forms? Um, well, I did, I started reading it like, old school reading um <laughs> and then i thought well i'll try i'll try the audiobook and i i restarted it and um it's three hours or so between three and four hours so it's uh you can do it in an afternoon in the morning which is what i did um and i'm glad that i didn't read the whole book without having gone back to do the audiobook because it it feels like it's the only way to experience this novel is her reading it herself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I could tell, and I didn't, I went into it kind of blindly. I had never heard of her. I saw the cover of the book, a bunch of colleagues, friends were sharing it on social media and it caught my attention. Um, I've been lately trying to bring in more poetry into my, the stuff that I'm reading. So it, mm. it, um, you know, it was kind of uh, serendipitous in that way, but uh, you know, so when, when I started listening to it, um, in, uh, the audio book, I thought, wow, this, th she's a spoken word artist and I didn't know anything about her and you could, it was just obvious. Mm -hmm. Um, and just, so I kept recommending it to people like, you know, don't read the book, which is usually not something <laughs> I say. We, but. We, we don't, we don't allow that phrase here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can edit that too, Richie. But um, I, I said, you know, if you can listen to it, listen to it. Um, try to do both, you know, mm. because it's just um, you feel her emotion and you feel her, her the, that powerful voice that she just exudes. And it, like I said, you know, and all poetry is meant to be heard, mm. right? And um, but I think especially especially this novel it's just so so powerful mm -hmm. especially with that's based around verse and poetry mm -hmm. right yeah. yeah um well aside from the poems i wanted to um 
my um, piece was the very last one, which is also the first and final draft. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, um, the only essay where it's presented as both a first and final draft, which is, I think, interesting. Right. The mm-hmm. first drafts are always, like, something different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She always turns in a different outcome. It, and I think it represents her evolution, right? Mm-hmm. That, you know, being more confident as a writer, being more confident in what she wants to get across to people. Um, evolution also in terms of her views. You know, it's it's it, it's um, epigraphed with Psalm uh, 119. The unfolding of your words give light. It gives understanding to the simple. And uh, she extrapolates from from this. You know, well, first, I think we should note that, you know, there's an eye reading there, right? That she's quoting mm-hmm. scripture. Mm-hmm. And yet um, she kind of takes that and she turns it into this kind of uh, more, you know, humanistic, uh, secular uh, view of, you know, um, scripture itself. And then also like, mm-hmm. you know, poetry, right? Because... Uh, the Bible is does have a lot of great poetry in it, mm-hmm. um, and um, the, uh, so so there's that you know that she says um, in this in the in the second paragraph. Um, I love this quote because even though it, it's not about poetry, it is about poetry. It's about any of the of the words that bring us together and how we can form a home in them. I don't know if I'll ever be as religious as my mother, as devout as my brother and best friend. I only know that learning to believe in the power of my own words has been the most freeing experience of my life. It's brought me to the, it has brought me the most light. You know, again, going back to the image of light here as, as a positive thing. And isn't that what a poem is? A lantern glowing in the dark. Um, so it goes back you know, to that other poem about her mom representing that kind of darkness that has been shut out because of what happened to her notebook, what she did to it. But I think it, um, I had mentioned this in your workshop, Vanessa, that I see it as maybe again, it's just me, but an allusion to um, Carl Sagan's Demon Haunted World, (coughs) Science is a Candle in the Dark. And Carl Sagan is, is one of my, uh, heroes, not just as a scientist, but in many ways, he's so poetic, right? Yeah, he, I mean, he's a flight attendant in the sense that he brings these these scientific ideas in in such a way that it can reach the masses. I'm a big fan. Hail Sagan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and 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 that in itself is is so difficult, right? Because science is comprised of facts, which make up theories. But a lot of that can just, you know, um, gets lost in translation. And um, so this idea now is her voice and poetry acting as that lantern, I find very powerful. Um, it also reminds me of, of Milton, one of my favorite uh, writers who, who said, um, you know, um, one of his, his sayings was, um, you know, to be inflamed with the study of knowledge and the application of virtue or something like that. And so there is the idea of like being inflamed, right? That she has represented throughout this work. Uh, and I, I think also from a stylistic perspective, what do you guys think of the fact that instead of, so she opens with a poem, but she chooses to end with an essay what do you guys think? Like, why? Why do you guys think she did that? I mean, I think that she kind of just did it because it kind of showed how she had grown, not only as a poet, I guess, but also as like a student. Especially because she does call it her first and her final draft, mm-hmm. which is kind of like pointing out her evolution. Yeah. I mean, it's like an, an amalgamation of everything you see in the book together, mm-hmm. how she's come to understand her the significance of her poetry as a force of light through the darkness, as, as you mentioned, but, mm-hmm. you know, through the sense of, of her writing and, and kind of be able to nail it in this, this first and last draft kind of thing together. It, it just, 
And it kind of almost puts her at, at peace of all the conflict of, of everything, you know, like using this, this Bible verse as a stepping stone to come to her mm-hmm. essay as her favorite quote. Mm-hmm. Raina, what did you think about her choosing not to end her story with, with a poem, given that um, you had mentioned that you know, this was also your first work where you read it, a novel in the form of, of poems. Um, well, I haven't given that too much thought. I think I'm still wrestling with why, you know, I wish I could ask her face to face. Maybe you will <laughs> why, one day. She, why did you do this to me? Yeah. <laughs> um, to me personally. <laughs> no, but I, I liked the choice too because I, I did notice that first and final draft and it made me... Um, just it, it just showed again her, what you've all have said um, her growth as a writer and just someone who feels more sure of herself because mm-hmm. she was doing those first drafts which are completely different from what she actually turned in right mm-hmm. um, her first drafts were very personal were very informal were very just like I'm throwing out an anecdotal thing here mm-hmm. and then the final draft was a little more stylistic or, or catering towards Ms. Galliano at least that's what I Mm-hmm. um kind of um figure it out but yeah i think that it it just um shows her her growth but i think it also i love that she included psalm 119 verse 130 because it shows a pairing it shows a marriage of you can still include scripture you can still be spiritual maybe not religious i feel like she's agnostic by the end of the novel mm-hmm. or she's always been agnostic mm-hmm. <laughs> but um but she can be both, mm-hmm. right? It's not just we have to be fully religious like her mother yeah. wants her to be or we don't have to be like these um, rambunctious poets. I don't know. What's <laughs> I, love it. I love that. I use that all the time. Huh? <laughs> That's who I am. Um, but she's, she's accepting and using Psalm and rewriting and, mm-hmm. you know, um, Using it for her, uh, um, reevaluating it, I guess, as her mm-hmm. own. Um, it's, it's part of her her identity you know, through is. her mom, and and in a way, it's that's how you know every generation is built upon the previous one. So it's her taking her interpretation, and she's finding mm-hmm. her own way. But now she's kind of acknowledging that part of, of mm-hmm. her her background, and and I think that's any any young artist mm-hmm. can should do that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not a, um, like you were saying. It, it, it's a hybridity. It, it's a. Um, it's not really a, a compromise, right? But it's like right. uh, it's 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 there's a harmony there, right? Like the yin yang, where you, seemingly opposing views um, have come together, and and it's her favorite quote. You know, according to mm-hmm. yeah, she's her. not mocking it. Yeah, she's yeah. not saying this yeah. is what it True. it could mm-hmm. mean, but yeah, this is how I interpret it. Mm-hmm. And more broadly, I think it just speaks, as I hinted at, to you don't have to be religious to find uh, any kind of religious scripture, right? Not just, mm-hmm. of course, the Bible, but like the Quran, um, mm-hmm. poetic. Uh, there's a lot of, of of beauty in there, and it doesn't mean that you have to believe it um so i again you know that evolution of hers that we finally see and that final submission of hers that represents this kind of closing of of the book of her life of of her academic career Mm. and of her vocational career as well um vanessa did you have any um final thoughts on on, on the work, on the offer, um, or anything else as far as um, what's coming up? Um, well, I really want to say that I really did enjoy reading this novel. Um, I really find that it shows the importance of how it is to share your voice, how important it is to, even if you're not necessarily going out and reading these poems or thoughts or ideas to anyone, just writing them down, making sure that you still have them, and you can kind of because I have a journal and I've wa- kind of watched my, like I can go back and watch myself grow up and kind of change and evolve and find different things that I'm interested in. And so I find like that's really a cool thing to have. And then in t- tying that into her new journal that's coming out next year, she has like prompts and stuff that kind of inspire you to share these thoughts and ideas also. 
as a kind of healing as well, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, mm -hmm. she does mention, reference a lot, the, and you reference this as well, Bridgie, that uh, there's a power in healing trauma. Yeah. I mean, of course, it's easier than it sounds, but you know, it's her. It's it is her kind of religious experience, right? To be religious is how she defines it in this poetic way, right? By performing. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that's that's a very progressive way of thinking about the role of religion in the 21st century. Spot on. Well, we want to thank you again, <laughs> Raina, for um, joining us and coming aboard. You're welcome back anytime. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not just saying that. I will crash this party <laughs> every weekend. <laughs> so so what, do, what do listeners have to look forward to in upcoming episodes? So this is actually our last discussion on The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo. And next month, um, we're going to start looking into Black Klansman by Ron Stallworth. Which will align with our literary fiesta on October 19. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to take place at the downtown or, or, um, public library here in El Paso. Uh, and for which um, we're hoping to um, hold a, a, a panel discussion, Vanessa and I and, and Reina, on, um, with, with Ron, the, the author, and uh, screen the film as well. Uh, so if you're physically here in El Paso, or even if, if you maybe want to just travel here, um, it, it's a great experience to kind of um, see other, see, you know, get his thoughts on, on the book. And then Richie as well has um, has a slot for his own poetry. So we're going to have poet, um, poetry readings that day. All of it is free. Uh, there's going to be goodies and giveaways and prizes. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a haunted kids. house. Yeah, you can bring bring the whole family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, no dogs allowed. Oh. This place. I don't, unless they're, <laughs> of course, service animals. But, um, but yeah, thank you, uh, everyone, for listening in, tuning in. Uh, stay tuned for our next episode. On yeah, first, don't forget to like and subscribe and give that five-star rating and share with friends. Yes, we're on Apple now, so we're really excited about that. So you can leave a review. We welcome any feedback. Um, and uh, pick up a book. Thank you. Thank you. Peace. <laughs>